All right, so we are back with a new Fashion Masters set podcast. We're getting this up and going again. This is very exciting because you and I haven't really just like sat down and chatted on camera in a while. And it's good to be able to keep up with this on like a weekly basis. I know a lot of our listeners have been asking for a podcast, some more longer form content. So here it is. We love doing it. So why not? And one of the biggest questions people always get, and we'll always be talking about this, like it's fascia, obviously, but really what is fascia? So in this episode, we'll be diving into really what is our perspective on fascia, the components that make up fascia. Is that important? Yes, but no at the same time. Like you don't really need to know as long as you know what the fascia is, what it does, how to release it and keep your fascia healthy. That's the important component. And then we're just going to go from there. So it'll be a fun episode. I'm looking forward to it. So we're with the real fashion master here. You're the real fashion master. I'm the baby fashion master. I'm still, I'm still learning. Um, we're all still learning. Yeah. <laughs> but you've spent how many hours in, in the fashion system working on people? Well, now it's, I would say, well over 60,000 hours. I mean, it's yeah, been 24 years since the beginning of this journey for me. And mm -hmm. I've spent so much time in my own body with my hands, which was really where the real learning came from because I was able to not only sense what was happening underneath my fingertips, but see and feel the changes and then apply that to my patients. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a 24 year journey. So I've spent, I spent a lot of time and I feel like I've been given a bit of a gift and that I can really see with my fingers. Right. So that's why I feel I have a different sense of what really fascia is because where people, um, traditionally were looking at cadavers to understand fascia, then technology changed and we could see things, but to really feel the way that it flows inside the body and how mm. it hooks and grips and, and what's going on. Um, that's what this is all about is being able to put into words and demonstrate what is happening and then to be able to give people a practical approach to resolve the issues that they're having by the understanding of what fascia is and how it responds to the forces of nature. Mm. So you were an athletic therapist. Yes, I retired a year and a half ago. After, which, is, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, after 25 years of being an athletic therapist, I never really practiced athletic therapy in the traditional sense of what it is, but I went through the program and totally. um, I always had a very different approach to the body. But um, yeah, I retired because, uh, I mean, it was really all about what we're doing here anyway. So It's a boss move Yeah, in my perspective. <laughs> I'm like, hey, you've been there, done that. Now we're running a company yeah. and we're saving or helping thousands of people around the world. Well, and the funny thing is, is people thing. say like, you know, you're running a tech company, which I, I always find comical because <laughs> I mean, like I am like really like challenged, as you know, with tech, but thank God for the team. It can be difficult. Yes, it can be. <laughs> That's why everybody has their positions and their lanes. But if you were to get too, I don't know, unfocused from the actual component of working on people, helping people, and you're more focused on the tech, that could be more cons than good. Absolutely. Or more, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's always good. Anyways, so athletic therapist for a very long time. Yeah, I certified in 1995. When I was born, just as a reference, <laughs> I'm 28. That's pretty crazy. So now we're working and building this company, continuing to build this company, helping tons of people with a fascia decompression technique. A lot of people don't get it. What is fascia? And like I understand why people are confused because I was confused and there's not a boatload of research on it. There is research, but it's interesting how they break it down and explain it. And I think it's still different than your perspective because your perspective is still research because you've spent so much time working on people in this tissue. And you know the difference between muscle tissue and connective tissue, which is fashion, how the connective tissue literally holds all system cells, structures, muscle fibers in the body together. So I'm going to ask you, from your perspective and definition, what is fascia? So like skin to the body, fascia is skin to the cell, interconnecting all of the cells together, and there's trillions of cells. So it literally becomes the communication between the cells. It becomes the structure to provide stability as well as mobility in the body. And that's really the key. It's all about maintaining space in and around the cell. As long as there's space, optimal space, inside the body, within and around the cell, there's ease of absorption. So the body's always sending the nutrients. And, and this is the cool part about 
understanding the fascia. We don't have to know what the cell requires as long as we support the fascia. The body knows. Mm. The body knows what it needs to heal, to thrive, to function and do all the, the beautiful things that it does. The body knows what to do as long as we support the flow. Mm. And so that's the key. If we keep the space, there's ease of absorption. And then there's always waste, right? Like, I mean, just like a car has exhaust, there's always um, waste material from every single function that occurs within the cell. So for us to be able to pull that out of the cell and exhale it or, or release it from the body, we want to keep the system easy in its flow, just like a city, you know, like there, there's ease of flow in the middle of the night when there's no traffic. And if there's no barricades blocking your flow right now in Winnipeg, <laughs> like when it's rush hour and we have construction everywhere, mm. it's chaos. People are stuck. Now the fumes from the exhaust, it's piling up because there's mm. not an ease of flow. So as soon as there's blockages or there's too much of something or there's not enough of something else, there becomes this chaotic system. And that's really what causes stress inside the body. So the fascia is here to support the cell and the communication as well as how we move, how we live, how we, how we breathe really. Mm -hmm. um, that's the key. So understanding how to support the fascia is really the key to health lifelong because there's really no disease. There's dis-ease. You know, d disease is this language like, oh, you have, you have restless leg syndrome or you have um, hyperthyroidism or like whatever the term is mm -hmm. that, that gives you this feeling of a limiting factor. Okay, now I have this. So now you're put into a system where you're going to be managing this for the rest of your life, where the way I see it, there's blockages to flow. Cells not receiving the proper nutrients, not being properly cleaned, that tissue, whatever it happens to be, it's going to give you some signal saying, hey, mom or dad, like, you know, I'm trying to do my job for you, but you're not looking after me properly. So here's a pain shot just to give you some awareness. Mm. We've been trained to kind of ignore those, right? So like, you know, let's mask it. Let's take some meds. Let's just posturally avoid it. It gets a little louder because it's not listening those that pain increases if we continue to ignore it though eventually it gets actually cut off and that's really where i see the real problems happening where there's dis-ease because now this tissue isn't being heard or and we're not responding to it appropriately like the baby crying you know pain is the baby crying mm. or the, it, it's the language that the cell uses to give us information that it needs attention so we've been we've been trained to look at this differently than really how it should be looked at mm. we we need to understand pain is not a bad thing pain is a language and if we have a proper approach we can undo what was going on, give it what it needs and allow that ease to come back in. And when there's ease, there's health. It's when there's dis-ease or lack of optimal flow that we get in trouble with our health. Right, right. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, <clears throat> people get really caught up in the terms. They get caught up in the terms. They get caught up in all these little things that they need to take, the big definitions, the... It's, it's, it's frustrating because if you're living by that, you're living by like a whole band-aid solution for the rest of your life. You have to take a step back and look at it from a full body perspective and realize, well, what's holding all system cells, structures, fibers in the body together? It's your fascia. Treat your fascia, make sure it's, it's healthy or decently healthy, you have optimal flow, then you should be in a very good spot. And, and a lot of people are in search of a diagnosis. And it's funny because then you get the diagnosis and then it kind of ends there. They're just there. terms made up. They're just terms. They, when they you really, really think are. about it, it's just terms made up by people. Right. And that's all it is. And sometimes that's all that you get for searching for it. Like, okay, so now I have a name to put to it, but that doesn't change the fact that you're struggling inside your body. So to have an approach, and that's why when you said at the beginning, it, it doesn't really matter what the components are. What are we going to do with it to keep it healthy and thriving so that we just can live the best possible lives we can live? And mm -hmm. if we have minimal pain, or at least we have an understanding of pain and we don't get caught up into the fear of pain and we have good mobility and we can handle stress fairly well. And we can, I mean, that translates to good relationships, to being able to be creative, to be able to play and to be able to work. Because, I mean, all of us are here to do something. I mean, we're not just here to, you know, sit back and relax. Yeah. Um, we're, we're here to, we have a purpose here. Yeah. And we're here to serve others. So we want the body that we have to function optimally. And by looking after your fascia, in my opinion, it's the most important thing to do to be able mm. to thrive in your life so that you can be the best version. Totally. Yeah. Love it. Simple. And, okay, so there's fascia. 
The components of fascia are collagen, elastin. What's that slippery stuff between called again? Hyaluronin. Hyaluronin. So again, there's still research done on exactly what fascia is. Again, does it really matter? Not a whole bunch. Like a lot of people are taking collagen supplements. I'm not going to share my opinion on that. I personally haven't taken it before. Will I? I, I don't know. But I don't know if it's necessarily you're taking collagen is going to be feeding the fascia. I don't know if it's as simple as that. Um, and what, do you know what? Just this is a side note. What are your thoughts on like teach, taking a collagen supplement? Like, does it make sense to you at all? If the body is working as it should be, we shouldn't have to take things. I've never been one to take powders or pills or supplements. It's, it's just never been in my repertoire. Now, I do understand that when it comes to eating nutritious food that we're lacking nutrients in the soil, so now the food is different, and I do understand right. that. But most importantly, the cells require oxygen to mm -hmm. thrive. So there's so much time and money and effort put into taking things when if we simply turn on this mechanism to feed every cell the most important nutrient life's completely different mm. then i mean yeah it's 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 never been my focus to take things i'm i'm also aware too i don't want to rely on things that might get taken away from me my breath is always here right. if i know how to breathe i'm in control yeah. of what i do with my body what i do with my health and that gives me peace of mind because i don't want to suddenly get reliant on something that for some reason might no longer be available to me because then you feel this this loss or this lack totally and i don't want that i i feel calm in knowing that i can take care of my body in the way that i do with my hands with our tools and that gives me huge peace of mind i think it's alex hermosi he's blowing up on social media right now he's like a big entrepreneur he started with like these gym launch um formulas or whatever but He's a brilliant guy. I look to him for a lot of things, but, and he's a big gym guy as well. Um, this isn't related to fashion, but he had a, a similar input or perspective when it comes to a routine even. Because if you become dependent on a morning routine, but let's say you don't have that. What if you don't have your vitamin C, your nootropic, your ashwagandha to help with your stress, your this and your that, and you just don't have it for a week because you're either traveling or you forgot it. You become so dependent on that that now you don't know how to handle yourself in situations when you don't have it. Right. So that's like the whole mind component as well, but something you will always have is our breath. Yes. And there's two different kinds of breathers, conscious breathers or unconscious breathers. Regardless, we're breathing. It just comes down to how conscious can you breathe. And just talking about oxygen, well, there's the whole Wim Hof method, um, which I think has many benefits, but I know we also share a different perspective on that as well. If you're pulling in too much oxygen, that can almost cause more, not, I'm not going to say more harm than good, but it can cause issues. We'll touch on that in a second, but I totally agree. Oxygen is the number one essential nutrient our body requires. But if your diaphragm's trapped and you can't access the diaphragm, you can't pull in the ample amount of oxygen to feed our body. And what happens to all of these names, such as what we were talking about before, all these diagnoses that are just man-made, what happens to them when we just feed it with oxygen or abundance of oxygen? Well, it's, um, we are physio physiologically, we are different animals when we consciously breathe compared to when we unconsciously breathe. And that's the thing. I mean, I don't want to say they disappear, but they kind of do, you know, like it's when you start feeding things and when you understand what's important to look at and it's, it's the structure the cell membrane. When that cell membrane is intact and it's strong and it's healthy and we can pull in what we need and release what we don't, then the cell functions perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I love it because David Belinsky, Life of a Cell, is a three minute video. He did a longer TED talk, but he shows this animated version of what goes on inside every one of our trillions mm. of cells in the body. And it literally brings me to tears. It is magical to think that there's trillions of these little things. And when you look inside the synchronicity of how they all function together, all these different components, and it's I mean, it just, it's God. It's, I mean, you, you can't even put another word to it. It's like yeah. literally like this, this is God and, and we've got trillions of them. So it, it makes you just appreciate this on such a different level when you can look at it that way. So imagine squishing it, you know, like as soon as you squish it, I mean, if somebody were, if an elephant were to sit on your chest, you know, you're not going to feel very good. And 
To think that we seal with a force of up to 2,000 pounds per square inch, that's the force that the fascia can grip and adhere to things in the body, creating this compression. Like that's phenomenal to even understand because we don't really sense it. I mean, right. some people feel dense or heavy or sticky or lack of range of motion, but to, to grasp that amount of internal pressure that's constant is phenomenal. So to re and to think of what that's doing to those cells is, is literally causing them to a scream mm -hmm. first and mm -hmm. then eventually just get shut right down. So now we might have 10, 20, 30% of our cells working for us instead of 100% of those cells working for us. And when we breathe diaphragmatically, we feed the body six times. That's 600% more oxygen. Like that's huge. And to know that that's what the cell needs first, this is the most important thing to do is figure out how to support that mechanism. And the diaphragm is unique. It's the only muscle that is under both our unconscious and conscious control. So as you said, we're gonna be breathing anyway, but there's a difference between being the unconscious breather whose body is literally in survival mode compared to being the conscious breather who's walking down the path of thriving. Absolutely. You just gotta be conscious about almost everything you're doing. Like you gotta think of it from the perspective of food, from exercise, how you're positioning yourself throughout exercise, how you're thinking, your thoughts, how to manage your thoughts. Like there's so many co components. That's the whole idea of like being conscious, but one of the biggest things you can do is be conscious of your breath. Yes. And there's so many things that we can do that's beneficial for our body where you don't have to take a thing. So again, that's the premise of block therapy. You're not taking anything. You're just releasing, oxygenating, and then maintaining your foundations essentially. Well, it's like a hug, you know, like when people are scared or upset or sad, your loved one is going to go and hug you. And that, affects the parasympathetic nervous system. It gives you that sense of, of safety, of peace. It calms you down. It relaxes you. So when we're connecting to the cells through fascia decompression that are deeper than what we're consciously aware of, those cells that have been ignored, just like children that are ignored, they're going to get, you know, they're, they're not going to be good kids because right. they're being ignored. They need love. They need attention. Or some sort of issue will be going on. Right. So yeah. when we, when we connect to those cells that are deeper than what we're consciously aware of, we start to hear what they're saying. They start to appreciate because they're still working hard for us. That's their job. Right. But if we're ignoring them, they can't do their job as well as if we can just say, Hey, I understand. I respect you. And I mean, like it comes down to how we think about our bodies. When I was 50 pounds overweight and it all was here, I hated, I hated this area and I spent so much time hating it. And then I read the Celestine prophecy and it taught us what you think you become. And I'm like, well, no wonder <laughs> you're full of shit, literally yeah. like toxic, ballooned, mm -hmm. awful looking. Like I felt yeah. anything but sensual or attractive. I mean, I'm full of waste. Yeah. So, and, and it was because I literally hated it. And that was such a turning point for me because I mean, I, I think it's, it's a stretch until you know it, where if you actually change the way that you think, you'll change the way that your body looks functions, feels, but mm. all you have to do is start. And it doesn't take any more effort to say, I love myself or I Ooh. love my body or thank you body for keeping me alive. Even though I've sent all this negative thought, it like gives some kind of gratitude and appreciation. Absolutely. And if you make that a habit, it doesn't take long before the cells hear you and they start responding and they start th there's more ease. And then we start making other choices because now we're not burdening ourselves with this negative low vibration mm. that actually makes us feel heavy and dense and it affects our creativity. So then you start waking up a little bit more and then that teaches you, oh, you know what? I feel a little more energetic today. Maybe I'll go for the walk and, oh, I just went for a walk. Now I don't want to put that chocolate bar in my mouth. I'm going to put that apple in my Absolutely. mouth, right? Like yeah. then you just take steps. And that's the thing. We don't need to go from zero to a hundred. Nature abhors a gradient. We don't want to do too many things all at once or we're just going to crash and fail right. one thing at a time. And if you start to breathe first, everything else will be easier. Changing how you eat will be far easier if your body's properly fed with oxygen because cravings will change. We're, we're craving something because we yeah. don't have oxygen. And I'm, I'm, I typically don't have a crazy uh, appetite. Like it's, it's pretty weird. And I've gone through phases like, okay, if I'm working out more, sure, my body's craving some more macronutrients, let's say. But typically, I don't need a ton of food. But I also want to look a certain way because we're all vain and I want to make sure that I'm keeping like my muscle mass up to, to an extent. But so we've talked about the importance of oxygen, mindfulness, realizing that everything is energy. 
Yes. Everything is energy. When, you, when we break it down to the, that simplistic form that we don't just live in this Newtonian physics, we live in the whole quantum physics where energy manipulates particles. Is it particles? Mm -hmm. So if energy is what's manipulating particles, you got to change your energy. And then now it's proven, even like we're, I'm a big Joe Dispenza fan, but he talks about how it's proven now that your thoughts can change your energy, which that energy can change matter. So start thinking positively about yourself. Start like, but feel it, like feel that I'm positively changing, I'm shifting. And it was Greg Braden in one of his books, The God Code, where he was talking about on the surface layer of every membrane of the cell is the message, God lies within. And the goal is that we turn on all of the codons in the DNA. So when we think about energy, the energy of love looks like this, fast frequency. The energy of fear is slower and more drawn out. The energy of our DNA equals the energy of the love frequency. Mm. So when we pass loving Automatic thoughts, it. appreciation, whether about ourselves, about someone else, about the world in general, we send that fast frequency and we're matching the frequency of the DNA. So we turn on all of those codons. So now again, like the cell, the optimal potential of the cell vibrates at that frequency. If we're, I hate myself, I hate this person, I hate the world. If we're like putting that out into the world, we're sending that frequency of fear through our cells and now we're shutting down some of those codons mm. so we start turning off our potentials and that's again like it's as simple as changing the way that you think i say it's simple because it doesn't actually take me doing something physical it's not so simple because again everything is a habit so i mean you might wake up in the morning the first thing i i, I do now and i've been doing this for years is this is the best day of my life mm. if i say this is the best day of my life somebody will say well is every day the best day of your life well yeah i want every day to be the best day of my life and if i wake up that day that way and i don't always wake up feeling like i want to say that yeah but if i say that then at least i'm putting that in my brain mm. it's, it's like somebody saying like you know if the first thing that you do is make your bed you've accomplished something and then from there you can go forward and you can keep accomplishing if you do nothing and you just you know, I mean, we all have those days where we just want to stay in bed, right? Yeah. I mean, like, and, and there's some days that I do yeah. because I'm going to respect the fact that, yeah. So, but again, I'm not going to be, oh my God, like I'm such a lazy, a lazy ass staying in bed all day. It's like, no, um, I'm actually going to appreciate now. Same as food. You know, like I've, I used to be such a awful mindset around food and stress eating. I had eating disorders when I was younger. So food became this really strange thing for me to communicate with. So now where if I do want to have that piece of dessert or something that might not be considered healthy, rather than saying, oh my God, like I used to, honestly, and this is, I mean, embarrassing to say, but when I was in my mess age of in my twenties, I used to go to a movie and I would eat a family sized pack of M&Ms all by myself in that two hours. <laughs> and the crazy thing about it was I didn't enjoy one of them because I was like, oh my God, I've got to finish them. I've got to finish them because I was in this weird mindset, like Interesting. The, the, the weird addiction around it. So now what I'll do is like, awesome. Like I'm actually going to eat this piece of whatever it might be and I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to be really grateful for that as opposed to the opposite. And you just change your relationship to everything mm. when you can have gratitude about it. And then it also veers you away from those addictive behaviors around mm. it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's huge. Like right there, I know we kind of went off topic with exactly what is fashion. That's what we like to do though. We like yeah. to, it, it's all, it, it all connects to the same thing ultimately. But um, that is so important that everybody can just understand that everything is just energy and you can change that nearly in a moment. Sure, for some people that have been caught in like a dark, heavy place for a long time, it can take time to rewire your brain and mm -hmm. to rewire the subconscious brain and um, but there's also more that we can do without taking anything in to help, such as I know we agree and disagree with this. I think it's a time and place where like cold plunges or saunas, that kind of thing. It's like, there's amazing, amazing benefits to it, but we're still not taking anything in. Yeah. Um, okay. So fascia. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I believe in the cold plunge. I don't believe in the icing. Right. There's a difference. Totally. Yeah. And as long as you're like 
conscious of your breathing while you are in a cold plunge and accepting that for the benefits of what it does. So I actually went to Thermea like a couple weeks ago and I went into that really, really Did cold Did you? Plunge. Yeah, it's I, terrible. It's terrible. It's like... <laughs> so I appreciate what it does. I don't enjoy it in the moment, but I completely appreciate oh, terrible. the benefits. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to be getting one soon. Cool. Because like, why not? It's also a big mind game too. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It's like if you can get yourself in that thing every single morning, you're accomplishing something big. And if you can breathe diaphragmatically when you're in that cold, now you've got the control. Totally. And then that's going to teach you how to, to control extremes. stressful situations Absolutely. with your breath. Totally. Same thing with saunas or steams. Love that. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about fascia and how it moves and what the hell does it do? So we know that it connects all system cells together, but what we find or what's interesting with fascia is it moves how we move and position ourselves throughout the day. So it's not like a muscle where it's like, okay, here's a bicep. It's doing what it's meant to do. It's going to contract and expand when I bend my arm in a certain way. Right. But fascia doesn't necessarily do that. It doesn't move in a linear way. So how does fascia move and migrate and how does it grip on to anything in the way? So the first thing that we need to understand is how energy moves in nature. It moves in waves and spirals. There's no straight lines in nature. So the Fibonacci sequence, the sequencing of numbers, zero plus one equals one, <laughs> one plus one equals two, one plus two equals three, two plus three is five, three plus right. five is eight. So that's, is that spiral? that's the that, spiral. The golden, the, the, what is it called? It's the, the golden mean spiral. So yeah. this is actually the Fibonacci sequence, the spiraling of the hand, the galaxies, the Nautilus seashells, the way right. flowers form, the way the body forms, even the way the body ages. So we don't just compress. We get shorter and wider as we get older, but we don't just compress linearly. Mm. We wind our way down. You can see smoke leaving a pipe. So if I had a pipe here, right from the heat source, it leaves as a wave. Once there's enough of a temperature gradient, then it starts to spiral. And then as it gets further and further away, it turns to chaos. So this is what's ultimately happening with our body. We are under this constant force of gravity. So we are compressing, but we're also dominant on one side. And so I'm right-handed. So typically this will be my action if I'm always lifting my right hand more. Collapsing so, to your left side. Collapsing to my left to keep that dominant side free for action. I actually find that the left-handed people in the world are more symmetrical because it's a right-handed world. Hmm. So the left-handed person is going to have to accommodate right. um, in certain situations where that right-handed person can almost go through life without having to use that left hand for anything more than, you know, support. Hmm. Um, but this is going to create a lot of rotation. So we wind down one direction or the other based on a whole number of factors, but dominance is, is um, a, big, a big one for that. So as we start to fall into this space, as we start to tip, now we have to create these shifts and adjustments so that we don't actually fall over. Right. Think of walking a dog. If I had a 110 pound German Shepherd that was really well trained and I had the leash and I was walking, you wouldn't see any tugging on my body. Mm -hmm. If this dog is whipping me all over the place, I'm gonna be getting pulled. And if I don't contract the equal and opposite side to create stability, I'm gonna land on my face. So the body is constantly being affected by these anchors, by, by gravity and how we position ourselves over time. So there's always these unconscious shifts and adjustments that the body inside is making to make sure we don't tip over. So when you, when you collapse, let's just take a step back for a sec. When you collapse, what happens to our fascia? Well, if I'm sitting like this all the time, this area is getting squished and compressed. So all this connective tissue is now starting to bunch into that spiral fashion yep. and become sticky, dense, or dry. Yeah, so if this is like the core of the body and I'm sitting upright, here's, let's pretend here's the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is supposed to be moving up and down in the body like this. Mm -hmm we all tend to collapse in the core. So now let's say I'm sitting in front of a computer for decades and I'm collapsing over to my left. I'm using my right hand with the mouse or whatever that is. So now I'm getting this spiraling action. And you'll notice the entire core is getting affected. The one shoulder is going to get pulled down. The, the other shoulder is going to, the entire body. Exactly. Yeah. The muscles in the back of the body are responding to that because again, we're getting pulled forward. So we're actually getting more tissue pulled to the front of the body. So we actually have all this potential energy in the front, but it gets all mm. locked 
and tied together. Potential energy is trapped in the front of the body. Yes, That's and then the back of the body, all this kinetic energy, because now everything in the back of the body is getting pulled further and further away. So now these cells are having to do extra work to try, the muscles are trying to keep us from tipping over. So they become exhausted. Because if this is how I sit all the time, those muscles aren't meant to do that. They're meant for other things. We have structures and foundations in the body that are designed to support proper alignment. But if we aren't conscious of those, the body has to compensate. Mm. And that's why fatigue and tension are created. And then these adhesions that are locked, they're, they're basically building these false walls and false floors. Because yeah. if we don't have stability, the body's going to compensate. And if it's a moment, like if we're, um, you know, very conscious, but okay, I'm sitting like this for a while, but then I'm aware, okay, I'm going to balance it out. I'm going to sit like this yeah. and I'm going to try to create yeah, balance like that's in not, my that's body. That's not an issue. No, not at all. Yeah. It's if I sit like this all the time and I never change it, then I actually magnetically seal in this alignment. So totally. it's, we're talking about magnetics now, which mm -hmm. is a whole different thing. This isn't a linear collapse mm. or a folding where we can simply release something. We have magnetically altered the tissue. Mm. So we need to understand magnetics and create opportunity to undo what that's done, which is what we do. Right. And I like to explain this kind of like Spider-Man in a way too. So how Spider-Man like tosses out his webs and whatnot. It's pretty much do oh, what uh, it was the Spider-Man movie where he was in the front of the train and he had to like shoot off his webs everywhere to stop the train because the brakes were failing to prevent it from or to at least allow it to stop. So I kind of see that in the body. When we top or tip off balance, it's like our connective tissue starting to like spit out these webs to prevent us from falling further out of exactly. alignment. So obviously at a much slower speed than just going like Spider-Man, but really that's kind of like how I see it. So if we are out of balance, the tissue is intelligent. The body, as you mentioned earlier, it knows what it needs to do. So it's being smart, it's gripping on to prevent your calf from externally rotating too much or internally rotating too much. So it's saying, ah, let's put a grip there, let's put a bit of a wall there so you're not gonna keep doing that. Oh, in your left low ribs, let's start like gripping a wall to prevent, you for, to prevent you from falling further. But then you keep doing that, keep doing that, that's where that magnetic seal comes into place. So you have to, cause then it gets to a point where you can't just wake up and do a stretch and it's like, oh, the cobwebs are kinda gone. It's like, nope. This is becoming more dense, more dense, more dense, layer over layer over layer. And it's chaotic. It's like, it's, it's chaos. Yeah, it's so, not like it's just a sheet. No. It's complete chaos. Yeah. So what do you do with that? So first of all, understanding magnetics. If, my mag if the magnets are far enough apart, they don't have an attraction. You get them close enough and then they seal like this. Hmm. If you've got magnets and you try to pull them apart this way and there's all this surface area connecting it, I'd say close to impossible to do this but it's easy to do this. Yeah. You can twist, twist and you can release. And that's one of the magic little formulas or tools or part of the teachings with block therapy is yes, isometrically leaning into the block and, and connecting to your conscious breath will help release the connective tissue. But a lot, a lot of that magic to release it comes in the torquing, the shearing of the tissue. And that was what I learned when I was about two to three years into this journey with my clients because for the first, you know, couple of years, I was going with the flow in my own body. I was translating what I was doing in my own body to my clients, going with the flow. And then one of my clients said, you need to be teaching this. And I thought, I don't even really know like what I'm doing, like how to explain it other mm. than showing it. Like, how do I explain it? And so what was interesting was at the time I had just bombed in business. I had a massive debt to pay off, which was a gift because for the next number of years, six hours a day, eight to 10 hours, I am working on clients in the dark with my eyes closed, candlelit room to pay back this debt. But this concentrated time of the work. And then when I was home, I was reading, I was learning on quantum physics. I was diving into thermodynamics and all of these sciences that were supporting what I was doing. I recognized I'm following the Fibonacci sequence with my hands mm. intuitively without knowing what I was doing. Mm. It became what was happening. I was, I was chaotic. So it wasn't like I was spiraling all the time. Like it, the movements were chaotic, but then I would hit dense tissue and I'd be like, okay. And then I would start to spiral into it and then eventually it would release. And then there was flow. So 
that was how I really recognized that, okay, I'm simply following the Fibonacci sequence. And then through the years of, you know, understanding what was going on in other people, my own body, and then what I was reading and learning, um, it all tied together to make fluid isometrics what it is today. Hmm. And then block therapy is a self-care version of fluid isometrics. Yes. At first I did try to teach people how to use their hands, which we do now. Yep. But if you don't have the concept of how deep we need to go through the layers of fascia, if you don't have the concept of really understanding pain as the goal, the language that we're using to um, direct us through the tissue as well as the breath. Um, and then some people just don't have the strength in the hands or they might have pain in their hands and mm -hmm. then like you don't have a tool to really yeah, understand yeah, yeah. this. So the block creates the tool. And then once you understand using the tool on your body, then bringing the hands in is, is a step next. Totally, Yeah. totally. Yeah, and we call that the art of fluid isometrics yes. in the site, which is really, really cool. People get amazing benefits. Then we have the new tool that we launched, the uh, block paddle, yes. which is very, very neat. Um, which is kind of like being able to use your hand more, which is right. really exciting. More, more of a handheld tool yeah. rather than something to lean into, yes. essentially. So it's interesting because we could have gone down the rabbit hole of you explaining how fluid isometrics and block therapy came to be, but I think we should do a separate podcast episode on that. Okay. I think people would really like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we've talked a lot about fascia, what it is, your perspective on it, how it connects the entire body together, how it grips and adheres, holds us out of alignment. So now with the block therapy system, and again, this isn't an ad, this is just us talking about, well, now how do we release it, really? So we talk about three components. What are those three components of block therapy? So I think before we dive in there, let's talk about just the difference between adhesion and scar tissue, mm. because what we're going to be addressing with the system are the adhesions and the scar tissue. Right, right. So I think it would be really good if we talked about that. So first of all, as we know, you can get scar tissue from an injury, yeah. um, a surgery. Basically, there's a gap in the system. So I, I sprain my ankle, I tear a ligament, I you know tear a muscle, I break a bone. Those are all gaps in the system. So nature abhors a gradient. That's the second law of thermo thermodynamics, meaning when there's a gap, nature's going to fill it in. So we have a choice. Now this is interesting because if we actually have acute injury and we'll get more into that at another time, but mm -hmm. we can actually rebuild the tissue as opposed to allowing scar tissue to form, but scar tissue forms from those things. Adhesions act like scar tissue. They form slowly over time through the layers, as you were explaining, like that spider web, those are the mm -hmm. adhesions through the layers of fascia, and then they hook onto anything and everything in its path, including bone, to create stability. So it's like a slow moving scar throughout the layers of the body over mm. time. So whether it's one or the other, the goal is that we're going to address the adhesions in the scar tissue because they are beaver dams to blood and oxygen flow, as well as to keeping the system clean. Right. So the first pillar is creating space. And, and uh, super quick, so scar tissue is fascia. It's collagen. Right. It's collagen. So fascia is collagen, elastin, hyaluronin, um, and maybe even other things, I don't know. But either way, scar tissue is just the collagen. Adhesions is just the collagen. So the- it, Scar tissue is like, you, you're not doing much with that. Like if you have, nope. cause there's scar tissue that can obviously not be superficial, but then there's superficial scar tissue. So let's say I just have like a massive, like a nasty scar on my arm. Then that's where it's white. There's there, no life. Is there's no blood flow. There's no life in that, in, in scar tissue. So when we're talking about healthy fascia, it's a combination of collagen and elastin. That the collagen gives the stability, the elastin gives the mobility, that combination gives the body the ability to move, but also be structured and stable. Right. So when we get rid of that elastin and there's just the collagen, now all we have is the structure. It's, it's, it doesn't have the ability to be elastic and to move. There's no blood flow, there's no life in it. Hmm. So it becomes almost like a dead space in the body. Hmm. Um, so, so adhesions you're saying are pretty well slow forming scars. Yes. In a way. Through the layers. Um, so it's not just on the surface. Like, I mean, think of, think of a, a burn and, and you can see, and it's, it's interesting because I, I did a blog on this not that long ago and I showed the similarity between how um, water freezes and scars on the surface of the body and they're identical in appearance because it's the same thing. We've got a fluid matrix or you've got water turning into ice. Like it's both frozen fascia or mm. ice. It's, it, it's fascinating mm. when you look at nature and the patterns of nature, you can really understand what's going on in the body. Everything is a, is, is a mirror of itself. 
So when we're freezing this fluid matrix that we have and, and turning it cold because we're not breathing properly, because that's truly the furnace of the body. And if you're not breathing that way and you're breathing through the secondary muscles, your body's cold, it develops these adhesions. It, it gets cold, just like mm -hmm. how ice forms. So the goal, the first goal, is to create space because we get right. shorter so and wider. That first pillar, the first of the pillar three. of the three for fascia decompression, and it requires all three. You can't just do one and expect that your body's going to turn around. You might get some improvements, but you really want to understand how to reset your whole system. So we create the space by melting through the scar tissue and the adhesions. And we do that by either using hands and moving into the tissue or lying on a tool because pressure over time creates heat. When we combine that, so let's say we're blocking. When we combine blocking in a certain area, we always stay for a minimum of three minutes. That's pressure. Mm -hmm. When we combine that with proper diaphragmatic breathing and we're turning on the body's heating system, we're heating from the outside as well as the inside. And we have a very effective way at melting through adhesions and scar tissue. So that comes with, though, the second pillar, which is inflating the space. So now we've, you, you were mentioning before how like if you're all tied together, you feel the density. So let's say like I'm sitting like this, I'm blocking here. If I'm holding my breath, I'm not really doing much because I'm, I'm going to get again that superficial heating, but we mm. want to heat from within. So now we start teaching you proper diaphragmatic breathing. When we're breathing through the belly as opposed to the muscles of the upper chest, we're pulling the air deeply enough into the lungs to reach that bed of abundance of alveoli, the oxygen mm. receptor sites. The majority rest at the base of the lungs. If I'm the upper chest breather, I'm, I may be pulling the air like to here. We need to pull the air all the way down to the base, which requires the belly, that expansion of the belly with the inhale, and then the moving out of all of the waste with that proper exhale. That's moving this plate of muscle in the body up and down. And what's cool, as we know from Newtonian physics, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Gravity is a constant force pulling us down. When we're properly exhaling, that's when this diaphragm plate is moving up in the body. That's the counter force to gravity. So we can go through time without gravity affecting us the way that it typically does by understanding how to access this muscle. Hmm. So when we open up that space through creating the space with the block and we're pumping blood and oxygen in with the breath and moving toxins away, now we've created a whole different scenario in that tissue. We've opened it, we're feeding it, it's starting to become alive again. Mm. But we don't wanna just fall back into that position again because that's what created the problem in the first place. So the third pillar is maintaining that space. How can I position my body to understand how my cells should be? And we have certain foundations in the body to support proper postural alignment. It's also about understanding how to use your body symmetrically. You know, like if I'm always vacuuming with one arm, over time, that action is going to continue to feed those grooves that I'm locked into. If I start doing things in the opposite side of my body, now I start recreating the movement and the grooves. And now I start mm. to bring balance and symmetry into the body. So that's really the goal is to be able to use all of our body for everything that we do so we never get stuck in a pattern of behavior or movement that's only going to kind of like bowling like you know the gutter we, we don't want to create these gutters because then we get yeah. caught in those gutters and then that's where mindsets come in and perceptions about life come in and addictions come in it's all trapped in the way that we live and and we get caught and the breath affects how we think so when we understand that, we can actually change how we think through changing the breath. Right. So let's say, because we were talking a lot about creating balance in the body, such as being as symmetrical as you can. What if I am a symmetrical bodybuilder, but I'm throwing some heavy weights around? Do you think that can cause a lot of issues too? Well, absolutely. Because... You might be symmetrical, but there's balance and symmetry we want to look at. So maybe you're lifting really, really heavy weight when you're, when you're lifting deadlifts. Is that what they're called? When you're just yep. bend over and you're lifting? Okay. So when you're doing that, um, you're, you're compressing your body forward. Our eyes are in front of us, right? So we, we tend to fall forward because we're seeing everything in front of us. We almost want to be living life in a bit of a back bend so that we can stop that forward collapse through that strengthening mm -hmm. that you're doing. So a deadlift would start on the floor like this. You would have good posture. Let's say I have great posture and I'm symmetrical and I finish off in that good posture and alignment, but I'm like, I'm a beast. Let's say, let's say you're like 200 and 
50 pound bodybuilder. Like, even if you're doing things correctly, do you think, even if you're not um, asymmetrical, you're still symmetrical, but you're dense. Like you're dense, you're strong. You've been lifting a lot of weights. There's still consequences to that. Absolutely, because first of all, you're, you're moving in a linear fashion. Energy moves in waves and spirals. So to balance out the deadlift, that, that would be like, you know, doing something on one side of your body and then having to balance it out. To balance your body, you'd be having to do the opposite. You'd have to go backward and lift on the opposite way to keep everything balanced and symmetrical, right? So the goal of bodybuilding is to become dense and hard, hard body, right? Is that not the goal typically? Yeah, essentially. Yeah, it's, it's to look definitely a certain way to have the right proportions, the right around or the right amount of muscle mass in certain areas of the body to definitely look sym symmetrical, proportional um, in all different areas. So, and of course you have to be super lean when you're trying to step on stage. And okay. so, so here's thing. the thing. Let's say, let's say you're, you start at the age of 18 bodybuilding or 30 or whatever age you are, you're starting from a place of contraction. So now you strengthen from that place. And if we're not always supporting proper cell alignment, then this, the more we strengthen, the more we're gonna become dense in that negative alignment. So I have yet to see, I mean, bodybuilding can be beautiful to see. We're, we're trying to make, we're, we're trying to cause the cells to expand beyond their healthiest version for a purpose. Using force. Using force, yes. So rather than integrating all of the cells in your body to be active when you're doing effort or lifting something, you're asking the cells that are available to become stronger. So maybe you're using 30 or 40% of your cells instead of 100% of your cells. Because again, let's say you're 25 and you start bodybuilding, but the 25 year old hasn't been conscious for 25 years. Now you go to the gym, you're aware of proper symmetry and, and, and things, but you're still starting from the place of my diaphragm is still gonna be collapsed and, and restricted to some degree because everybody's will be. I've yet to see a perfectly aligned body in this world of all the people I've looked at and seen. Mm -hmm. Nobody is breathing perfectly. I don't think right. we'd actually be here if we were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we're, we live in a dualistic world, like you know, every, everything is, is what it is and we're under the influence of gravity and negative forces all of the time. Mm -hmm. So what you're starting with isn't perfect alignment. So then you start building on that imperfect foundation and you're gonna be calling on the cells that are available. So let's say you have 100 people working for your company, but only 30 of them are really working. The other 70 are just kind of lazy. You're, you're paying them, they're taking your resources, but they're not adding to the benefit. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like how you can look at the body with, the, hmm. with, with doing exercise. Kind of dormant. Yeah, so then you've got 30%, let's just say, as an example, having to do the job of the 100 and 70% of the resources are going to the people that aren't actually doing anything. So these 30 are gonna exhaust, and they're gonna exhaust a lot sooner than if you had all 100 people working right. as they should be, Absolutely. like a candle. I mean, even think of a candle, how it burns. If you have a really good, clean, high quality candle, and the wick is perfectly centered, you light it, the whole candle will slowly burn until mm. the entire amount of the wax is used up. But if you have a candle where the wick is slightly off and you start to burn it, now it's gonna burn one side and you're gonna, that, that candle's Collapse gonna die yeah, yeah, yeah. before you've used all of the potential for that candle to burn because mm -hmm. it's not perfectly symmetrical. Yeah, absolutely. Because even when we're going to the gym or just the aspect of trying to build muscle, we are purposely tearing the muscle tissue so that it can rebuild to become bigger and stronger. So it sends all this inflammation to the area um, and it's trying to rebuild. So that's another reason why they will say don't do cold plunges after you work out because that's gonna slow down the inflammation, but you want the inflammation to go there because it's an injury and you gotta heal it. But if you are not treating that injury correctly, such as going to the gym, that can create little scar tissue, which it is because essentially every time we're going to the gym, we're injuring ourselves on purpose, yep. but then we're just relying on the body to heal itself. So I think there's like a balance between it's okay to work out, throw weights around if you're conscious, healthy, you're decompressing your body through a fascia decompression technique. And that's, I think that's fine. But when you overdo it and you don't have the balance of the mindfulness, the 
talking to your cells correctly, the breath, the fascia decompression, the nutrition, that's when it just goes overboard. And that's what I've seen because I've, I've competed eight times. I've seen some absolute beasts and monsters in the world and I know they're not healthy. They don't look healthy. They don't, they don't seem healthy. Some of them do or healthier, I would say, but a lot of the time you are a hard, dense body, but you want a muscle to be able to contract, but also just be super chill. Because the dense body, if it's dense all the time, it doesn't have the space to receive the nutrients and to be clean. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. So um, I'm not saying not to exercise, not to bodybuild, but to understand because you're creating density or you're creating compression to decompress though. Right. And, and I think sometimes there's a mindset with the athlete that doesn't want to be in a restorative space. You know, we need to restore. And that's totally. what fascia decompression is. It's a restorative practice. So to think of, I'm going to lie down on the floor for 30 minutes when you're, you know, in your mind, like you're motivated and you're, you're high energy and you want to go, go, go to consider that, you know, how can this be considered exercise or, or is this not, a, I, I actually remember, cause I, I used to be a gym head myself. Like I, I was really strong. I used to have like two forty-five pound plates doing, you know, I could do 10 reps with that and amount of press. weight. And, um, I remember hearing, cause I mean, my goal was always to be skinnier than I was. That was always my goal. So like I'm working out like a fiend, of course I'm getting bigger because I'm lifting a lot of weight. But I remember somebody saying at the time, like if you spend 10 minutes stretching, you're going to increase your, um, your metabolism. And I'm like, I feel like it's a waste of time. I'd rather mm. like be on the treadmill. I'd rather be sweating. I'd rather be mm. working really hard because in my mind I was like, I have to work hard. I have to beat myself up and force myself if I want to get the results. Totally. So to slow down. That's 99, oh no, I won't say nine. That's 90 plus percent of the population. Exactly. And, and that's where we get caught up. We need the balance. We need the rest. We need the re restoration. And that's what this work does. And I would say, as you said, like probably 99% of the people were in fight or flight mode. If we're breathing through the muscles of the upper chest, we're in fight or flight mode. Our adrenals are exhausted and we don't have that time to repair properly. So then you go to the gym and you work out again and you haven't repaired from before. Totally. Um, then you're just, again, you're creating more scar tissue, more blockages, and you're going to age yourself a ton faster. Well, and for those that do have some health issues, whether that's some sort of dis-ease or whether that is, I, I'll say cancer, whatever it is, whatever. Your body, if your body's trying to recover from torn muscles almost every day, but your body also needs to start sending all of this energy to other areas of the body, not just the muscles. Now you're just sucking this life out of where it really wants to go to the muscles because it's taking that first action. It's saying, okay, well you just tore me back up again in the gym when I'm trying to put all this energy into repairing you from all the other stresses of the world and you just drank way too much and ate crappy food. I'm trying to detoxify your liver and this and that and work to your advantage, but you're not allowing me to. You're just, you're just throwing yourself in the gym, fight or flight mode, tearing the tissue, and all my blood is going into the muscles. And that's pretty well fight or flight. When you're in the, that sympathetic state, your blood is getting rushed to the muscles. You're, you're adrenalized, you're needing to work. It's fight or flight. Or another one's freeze, I think. Fight, flight, or freeze. But regardless, that's the state. So we gotta be able to chill and that took me a long time to figure out i i had to have a wake-up call to be able to get to that state and a lot of people do yeah um but it's amazing and and that's like the silver lining to everything but it's amazing how fast the body can heal when you just allow it to it's incredible and i mean i think of when you don't need much no and i think of when covid started and suddenly for like a, a, a moment in time there was nobody traveling there was no toxins being thrown out and suddenly you know you could see the pyramids where before you couldn't and the dolphins were coming back and i mean like just nature is so incredible when we stop polluting it and when we just give it a moment right and the body's yeah. the same if we can just give ourselves a moment and i mean Again, we're, we're being flogged by so many toxins that are new to the world, like 144,000 more since the 50s. So, I mean, like our bodies are always, they're, they're already having to work harder than they used to. And that's why we need those moments to rest and to just give that breath time and mm. 
connect to that parasympathetic system. We need the balance of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, but most people are just sympathetic. Yeah. And, yeah, and we've got to create that balance. We don't want to be just parasympathetic because then totally. we won't be moving, yeah. but we need balance. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. Um, whether we're talking about the right and left side of the body and bringing balance in, it's all about the balance. Yeah. And it's not that we'll ever na actually probably achieve perfection and balance, but that's the goal. Yeah. And you know, I, I loved it because Carl Jung was saying, the deeper you fall, the higher you can rise. Mm. And I think of that because I mean, like I really struggled in my earlier years and I was a complete disaster, but I recognized that I truly believe that this work came to me because I went so far into the dark side. Now I was able to move in that direction. Mm. If I only went here, I could only go here because everything mm. comes back to the balance like that, you know? Yeah, so yeah. we want to, we want to be able to explore but when we can explore consciously and we can actually, you know, look at our shadow side and we can see it for what it is and not mm. hate it, that's kind of like the pain piece. Like we don't want to, we don't want to ignore it. We don't want to ignore right. the pain because it's just going to scream louder. We don't want to ignore our addictions because they're just going to knock on the door harder. We want to mm. understand them and move through them so that we can approach life with all sides of us, because this is where creation comes from, creativity. Um, I mean, some of the, again, like th this whole process happened at, as a result of an anxiety attack yeah. of me being a complete mess and a complete nightmare in my life and needing a solution. I don't think I'd be alive today had it, this not happened to me because of where I was, but now we're helping people and that's right. the point. So right. I, I think that's the thing. Like mm. we're, we're here to be challenged. We're here to, um, to bring forth something that can serve the world. And you know, if everything is light and fun and airy, you don't challenge yourself to figure things out because everything is light mm -hmm. and fun and airy. Yeah. It's only when we're struggling and we're stressed Absolutely. and we're dealing with stuff that we need to find a solution to pull ourselves out oh, of it. Yeah. And that's where, I mean, most, most healers, you know, have learned something through their suffering. Absolutely. That's a very, very good point. And that is so true. Yeah. Even, even what we've gone through in addition, like you've gone through a lot to get to where we are today where you are today and then we've gone through other struggles of building the company and it's so difficult because not even just like the tech piece of trying to build it in the marketing it's just well yeah the marketing's hard because it's a new technique people don't know what fascia is so we're trying to a explain fascia how fascia is responsible for nearly everything or at least plays some sort of role into nearly anything in the body and people are like okay so you're saying this can help with weight loss or muscle gain or my chronic pain. Now you're saying I can look younger. I can feel younger. You can improve my vision. You can help with Parkinson's. You can do this. It's like, okay, that's too good to be true. But is it? It's not. It's because it's the fascia. It holds everything in the body together. Take a step back and look at this from a granular perspective. That's what people need to do. Stop being caught up in all the little intricate names and definitions of what I have or what I may have or what I'm scared or fearful of having, you don't have it. Like if you do, sure, but we, you can work towards getting out of that. But don't think that you might have this, you might have this because you're manifesting yourself to have it. Mm -hmm. You don't need it. Just be healthy, stay connected to your breath, staying connected to your breath keeps you more in that present moment. Um, like what Eckhart Tolle talks about as well, that diaphragmatic breath connects you to the parent's sympathetic state which brings you into the moment brings you into the now there's only the now past and future is kind of just false energy acting real fear false energy acting, acting real, real. Or, yeah, yeah because again your fear is different than my fear so yeah. being that everybody has their own fears what is it's, fear? Like it's if all, you're afraid of an elevator, I'm afraid of a maggot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, these oh, things like, like they freak me right out. Oh, and, yeah. and yet, I mean, elevators. it was funny. I was watching a, an episode of Grey's Anatomy last night. I, I don't like anything that's like wormy. And, and there was this one episode last night where a guy had like all of this stuck blood flow from whatever. So they put leeches on it. And I'm just like, oh my okay, gosh, I cannot imagine. Way. I couldn't pick one up and, and you'll go fishing and you'll put one on a whatever. And so, I mean, we all have our fears, but there's nothing scary about them. It's my perception of it. That is, that is such an interesting concept within itself because you realize everything is just, it's how we perceive it. Everything is that. So you can literally change things with a snap of your fingers. It's not as easy as that because we're human and it takes time to rid of fear and 
when I was able to, when I was the most comfortable in elevators is when I was meditating an hour a day, doing a ton of block, I would, um, not necessarily affirmations, but I would be extremely grateful for everything I have. And I just felt present. I was in there. I'm like, I know I'm fine. I know I'm not going to get trapped in this elevator. I know they're going to open. I know it's not going to, the cords are going to snap and I'm going to have the worst, most terrifying de death in the world. <laughs> Cause that's still what I can think at times. But if I'm in a heightened state, there's times I can be like, okay, okay. Did they close? Are they opening? Did the doors open? Like it's, it's weird how the brain works. So. Well, and on that note, we get caught in a pain, fear spi spiral or cycle. Yeah. So pain surfaces that I don't understand. Okay. So let's talk about just a little analogy because this is so, um, I, I wrote about this in, in one of my first books that I ever wrote. So when a pain surfaces, if we don't understand it immediately, oh my God, do I have cancer? Do I yeah, have this? Yeah, yeah. Am I going to die? So let's say, okay, I'm scared because I don't understand this pain. So I'm going to make an appointment for the doctor. I mean, in Canada now, I mean, it might take you years to get in <laughs> to see the doctor. So now you've got, you've got a long period of time from the moment where this pain is making mm. you afraid to even potentially having a diagnosis, if they will even know how to give you one. And so through that period of time, because pain, fear, and stress cause us to reactively hold the breath, you are continuing to go into freeze mode and you are actually manifesting, you know, more and more of this because it's all about breathing. So mm -hmm. because that response to pain, fear, and stress is to freeze, if we are caught in that spiral in that cycle, that brings up fear. The fear, again, our brain mm -hmm. takes us into crazy other things. It creates more pain, which creates more fear and we're locked. Yeah. And now we're this frozen and, and now we don't even move, right? So now all of those adhesions are forming because we're so afraid to even move. So the analogy that I like is, you know, if, if you move into a new neighborhood and you're spending the first night in your home and you wake up at three in the morning and there's strangers on your lawn, you're probably going to be like, Oh my God, like what's going on? Who's out there now? If you had met your neighbor and your neighbor was friendly and all good. And then you wake up at three in the morning and you see your neighbor on your lawn, you're not going to think anything of it. Right. Right. Because you met the neighbor. Oh, the wacky neighbor again. Right. Just playing lawn games at 3am. Exactly. <laughs> so if we meet the pain, then there's nothing to fear. Right. And that's what we do with our process. Hmm. We move into the tissue to say, okay, pain, I've got some weird pain here. So I'm going to move in. It's I'm going to move way in of explaining it. with pressure and pressure overrides pain. So what's cool is this pain that lives here. Now I'm lying on it on the block or I've got my hands in there, whatever it is. And I'm feeling, and I'm like, before I know it, well, the pain isn't there anymore. You might open up to some deeper pain, but then you're going to keep going through this process. So now you have a process hmm. to deal with the pain. So pain simply now is information. It's a language. It's the cell saying, Hey mom or dad, you know, I'm, you've been crushing me for the last 10 years because you've been sitting incorrectly. And now I don't have enough strength to not tell you get off me. Right. No so now we have a process to put that space back, send some love and some healing energy and some blood and oxygen back in. And then repair starts to happen really quickly. And then it's so incredibly empowering because now you've just managed to deal with your pain and also, holy smokes, my golf game is better because I have better rotation. Mm. And so there's all these like secondary gifts yeah. that come from this journey. So hmm. it's fascinating. And it, it just truly changes the way you view life in general, because if you can take the fear out of the pain, fear equation, pain that most people struggle with. And if like, if you go to a restaurant and you listen to people talking, cause I do all the time, <laughs> I'm like, okay, everybody's talking about what bothers them, what hurts yeah. them, the pains that they have. Take that fear out. And suddenly it's just like, I don't need to talk about it. I know I'm going to go home after this. And if my foot hurts, I'm going to block it. Totally done. Yeah. That's a very liberating feeling. Mm -hmm. And just knowing, even if I was just listening to this from an outside perspective, it's like, wow. Okay. That, that's just cool to know because I've lived in the state where I haven't really had fear of pain for a long time. Sure. There's times where it's like, okay, weird things have happened. And I'm like, Deanna, what the hell is going on here? You're like, Hey, this is going on here to do this. So sure, we, we do need like at times a grounding partner to help in those situations, but high, high majority of the time, I'm not scared of pain at all. Like I'm not, it's, it's just when you get it and you understand what it is and it's there, it's never going to go away. Like, like this hurts. It's not going away. And you wouldn't want it to go away. Yeah. I mean, some people that are in chronic pain might say that's crazy to say, but you know what, if I put my hand on that hot element, I don't want my skin sizzling. I want yeah. to have that pain shot to say, no, don't do that. Totally. 
It's a language. No pain, no pleasure. You don't want a baby that doesn't cry. Again, you might say if you're not getting any sleep, that would you just stop crying? But if the baby's not crying, the baby's dying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so same as the body. Like the, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. body is, it's a language. And it's just like, I mean, I was talking about technology um, before um, because I'm, I'm so clueless on it. And it, it, if anything, it stresses me out and I can feel myself. That's the thing that will make me react and go like, oh my gosh, because like, I feel like I suddenly freeze because I'm, I'm in front of this machine that I don't really understand and yeah. I've got to still use it and things don't work. And then I get panicked. I'm better because I'm like, okay, I'll figure it out or someone on our team. Will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But either way, that's the cool thing about the block. The block will help you figure it out and it will help you understand. And when you start to connect with those cells that are deeper than what you're consciously aware of, your cells communicate to you. Mm. We need to learn the language, just like we need to learn the, the way that the baby's crying or we need to learn, you know, a different language like the medical language if, or, or legal language. Like it's all a different right. language. If you don't understand it, you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. But when we take the time to spend time with our cells, the information comes, you yeah. become more intuitive yeah. and then you know, okay, this isn't something scary or you know what? This is something that I feel I need to get additional help with. I am going to go to the doctor, but in the process, I'm still going to feed and do what I can to, Absolutely. to help my body. Yeah. There's, there's no harm in doing that in opening the gates of flow. No. The body knows what it needs to do. There's no harm in cre increasing oxygen. No, no. If, yeah. if you're going through this process, um, oxygen is, it's the healer. It, it really is. Yeah. It's the life force. We die in five minutes without it. So, um, all of our cells are mini, Crazy to think that. mini brains or, or mini people. Yeah. And we're just a, a large version of a cell really. Yeah. And just like with the whole component of technology, technology is there. It's not meant to be difficult. It's actually meant to be, to help us to be beneficial. But a lot of people look at the body similarly so difficult. I don't get it. What is it? Just allow it to do what it needs to do. How do you do that? Open up the gates of flow, feed it with what you need. We talked about a lot of that today. You just got to allow it to happen. So, and what do I do with technology? Quinn, I need you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do when I'm freaking out about my body? Deanna, something's going on here. <laughs> That's why you need partners in life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that was a lot of fun. That, that was, was a great, fun. that was a great first discussion podcast that we're getting back into. So these are a lot of fun, yeah. nonchalant, um, very educational with you being here. I'm working on it. <laughs> and uh, You're awesome. Best partner in the world. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah we're doing some cool things and yeah, we we're going to keep doing it. So anyways, um, if you are listening to this on YouTube, you have any comments, uh, let us know below. If you have any ideas for a future podcast, let us know. If you're listening to this on Spotify, thank you very much. And to learn more about what we do, check out blocktherapy.com. You can explore the YouTube channel. You can find us on all social media handles at Block Therapy. And that's everything. We'll see you all in the next episode. All right.